Okay, ready? As ready as I ever am. You interrupted me. I was in. I was just about to drop my welcome back. I was in the flow, and it's part of my creative process. And now that I stopped, I missed a beat, and I don't even want to do it anymore. Let's just start the show. You know, okay, okay? so so <laughs> no, it's 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 Wes being a diva, like I, I like the, all the actors, man, the fucking divas. Like, oh, you you it you messed up my my workflow. You messed Listen, up my headspace. Look, greatness is great, but it's also delicate. Okay, all right. So respect the process. All right. <laughs> Welcome back. Did to you Ty just call Act. yourself great again? You did it, and then I was doing something. I had a different creative choice. I had a different creative choice, and I was going to throw some at, stuff up. At, at this point, I'm just fucking with you. I know. Right, I'm going to shut up. I know. Hey, do they do? I wonder if the welcome back part is part of the uh, their bingo game. Maybe we can take that away from them. We did talk about at um, at the panel that we were aware of their drinking game and their bingo game, yeah. and that we were deliberately doing shit to get them as wasted as possible <laughs> and leaving out things to do that. Anyway, we've started. Uh, I'm uh, I'm West Chatham, and this is my dear friend Ty Frank, and, and uh, we're here to bring you wisdom, knowledge. Truth, justice, and the American way. Did you have a good weekend, Ty? I, I'm a little worried about this truth part. Like, cause that <laughs> does that mean I can't lie this whole podcast? Because I'm, I'm normally like 97% of what I say is just a fucking lie. So. Well, I mean, look, today, I mean, we're going to do some lying and bullshitting because none of us had time to really prepare. We, you know, we're usually <laughs> like sticklers about preparation, but uh, we've been busy and we're going to talk about uh, season five, episode nine. But we've already did a podcast on kind of the deep dive, the breaking it down like we normally do. So this yeah. time today, we are going to focus on one of the the sequences that I think is one of the coolest in the Expanse history. Not because I'm not just because I'm a part of it, um, <laughs> but because it was this epic long shootout one take situation. But before we do that, Ty, I want to talk a little bit about this weekend at Dragon Con. First of all, it was a blast. We had a blast at Dragon Con. We have the people that are interested in the Expanse and love talking about the Expanse are the coolest, coolest people ever. I mean, everybody is just so kind. Uh, they're interesting. They're smart. Uh, this one man, and I wish I remembered his name, 3D printed Bobby Draper's full on battle armor. With the yeah. ro- rotating Gatling gun and all, it was. I've un- I've seen the pictures. It's amazing. It's amazing. Do, do, you, mean, do you know the guy's name? Um, I've, no. s- I've seen the pictures online. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you're listening to this uh, dude who made the the Goliath armor, um, everybody has been incredibly impressed. Everybody's seen it. Everybody loves it. Yeah. And it's operational. Yeah. Like the yeah. Gu- the, the Gatling gun spins and it lights up, and and I was just in awe over it. And, you know, people 3D printed the Rossinante, people, the cosplay was, was amazing. Um, just the, the love and support of the show and the expanse was just, it was just, it was fantastic. We have actual evidence from uh, sci-fi that expanse fans are, as an average, wealthier and more successful than other fans on the sci-fi channel. So sci-fi channel when they were, when we were, I think we were doing the second season or third season of the show on Sci Fi Channel. They did, you know, their, their market research stuff that they always do. And they released to us, the producers of, of The Expanse, uh, some, some of the output from their market research. And one of the things their market research had determined is that The Expanse was the most uh, successful audience, a monetarily successful audience that on average that the sh- that they had ever had for any of their shows and it was also the best educated audience um on average that they had ever had for one of their shows so we have market research evidence that people who like the expanse are on average more successful awesome. and better educated <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it doesn't surprise me that when you talk to these guys at the conventions they're they're smart they're interesting they've got cool stuff to say they're they're incredibly creative they have the the technical know-how to put together these Mm -hmm. amazing things Mm -hmm. Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all yeah you know it really changed the way i look at conventions i mean i did other i've worked on other things that were uh convention heavy and i never enjoyed them until i started doing the expanse and i really enjoy it i really hanging out with the people and talking with them 
And this podcast has become a really great outlet and community and interaction with the people that come up. I love it when they come up and and say, hey, man, I, I you know, I, I listen to Ty and that guy. And then I feel like we immediately kind of have a connection and we talk about yeah. And they're like, man, we watched, you know, and what I love the most is like, we watched Big Trouble in, for, in Little China for the first time. I, me and my wife watched it and we, and they have thoughts about it and comments on it. And one of the things that we talked about doing, um, and I need to get better at this, but uh, one of the things we talked about doing is if anybody comes up and mentions Ty and that guy, you can write down a question in your name and just put it on my desk on the, the, the table that we're, the next podcast we do, we'll kind of give people shout outs like the guy, which we so we suck with that. We don't remember his name that. 3D printed that Goliath suit. And then I'm going to read the questions and we're going to talk about the people and that gave us this and everything. Now, there was a stack of questions on my desk, or not my desk, the table that we do. Uh, when we left for break and came back, they cleaned the desk and I guess they thought it was trash. And so they threw away most of the questions. I apologize. I'll figure out a better system. Maybe I have like a little bag or something that they can just put them in. Um, but I did have the questions from the, the end of the day. I did salvage a few of the questions. So I apologize if you did that. And next time, I promise it won't happen. Um, also, Joseph, uh, I don't know how we made those like tying that guy buttons, but that would be fun to bring back to, to give out to people um, as well. Yep, we will do. Okay, so the first question is from Michael Owl. Do you have a favorite Native American writer? Stephen Graham Jones does a lot of horror and mystery um and so like that genre is in my strike zone so i really enjoy that and uh and and you know he's somebody that i i enjoy what do you think Ty? yeah yeah you know he's good um so i am fortunate enough to be acquainted and friendly with rebecca roanhorse who is a, a local new mexico writer so when i lived in new mexico we we ran into each other a few times at various events um a, a lovely person and has become a a very successful voice in uh, modern fantasy. So she, and she, it, she definitely puts a native American spin on her fantasy includes a uh, uh, native American um, mythology in her fantasy books. Yeah. So uh, she's, she's definitely one that I'm, I'm really familiar with recently. Uh, if you want to start with her, uh, try trail of lightning. One of, is is one of her first books in her series. So uh, yeah, uh, she's she's great. So if you're looking for more native voices to uh, to read, she's uh, she's current right now and she's writing like crazy. I think she's already got like a dozen books out, and she just started not that long ago. I'm curious. Let me ask you a question. So generally and specifically, what draws you into a book? Like when you start reading a book, what is the things that like you read it and you're like, oh, I am, I am on for the ride. I am on board. And you can reference books that you read before and it kind of brought you in. Generally, like it's, you can tell something is well written, well thought out, well planned. You can realize you're in good hands. And specifically things that just get Ty excited, things that, that are just in your strike zone that you find really interesting. So I'm a world building guy and, and always have been, you know, that, which goes back to my, you know, being a, a kid in, in grade school playing d and I, I liked creating worlds. So when I when I open kind of crack open a book, whether it's it's sci-fi or it's or it's real world, it doesn't matter. What matters to me is that I quickly be, it quickly becomes clear that the writer is going to show me a world I haven't personally experienced before. So even if it's even if it's like literary fiction or even real world, like you know biography or whatever, if the writer's taking me behind a door I haven't been behind before and showing me things that I've never seen before. That's what pulls me in right away. Um, I just, I just want to see something I haven't seen before. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like for me, I'm the same way. I think that uh, first thing for me, um, I can tell in the very beginning that if, if the writer, if, if everything has a purpose and there's a meaning to everything. And so I feel like I'm in good hands, but ultimately I like, I like breaking from reality. So if I'm reading something and I get a sense right away that we're going to live like, you know, there's something about Stephen King or, you know, the, uh, many other writers that. But if I'm reading something that I feel like is going to break from reality, like Ray Bradbury, you know, when you jump yeah. in there and you start reading and there's something fantastic that's going to happen. You go back to the Twilight Zones. I think the reason I love Twilight Zones so, so much was more about the anticipation of something paranormal, something supernatural, something outside of the realm of reality, something uh, dark, 
uh, that's going to happen. And that, that really pulls me in. I'm also a big fan of, I don't know why, and I live in one now, but I'm a big fan of small town. I like, you know, and I think, I think the, one of the reasons I'm so attracted to Stephen King is that I love these little towns in Maine. I love this characterizations that he creates, these people that you feel it's very lived in. You feel like, you know, these people like uh, something wicked this way comes like that's one of, yeah. to me, like when I was a kid, that is my strike zone. You got this small town, you got these kids and they're up against something dark and paranormal and supernatural that they're outmatched for. And they got to reach deep within them, side themselves and their older father. And it's just uh, that that's that's in my strike zone. That's what I really enjoy. I like reading about small towns. I don't like living in them. <laughs> so you had this great thriving writing community in New Mexico. Do you have that same thing where you are now? There's a lot of really good writers here in the Northwest, a lot. And I mean, obviously, COVID has meant that, you know, people don't get together the way that they they did before it. But yeah, I mean, I, I've had a few uh, of the local writers come out. Uh, Lainey Taylor's a good friend of mine. She's a local writer. Um, she's been out to the house a few times with her family. Fonda Lee, who I hadn't met before I moved out here, but she's been out to the house a couple of times. And his like, she's she's just like coming on like a storm in the writing world right now. Her her most recent book was up for Hugo in this this last awards. Oh, by the way, uh, the Expanse won the Hugo this year. Just. Yeah. Did we, we got a, I got a text and I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't know if it was this year or last year. It or was, anything no, like it that. was, it, we just won this, uh, this weekend, uh, for episode 10 of season five. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so Fonda is a, a local writer. Brent Weeks is a friend of mine. He's a local writer. Uh, there's a bunch of writers up in, in Seattle. I'm about three hours from Seattle, so I don't go up there very often, but uh, Ramez Nam and Peter Arulian are two friends of mine who live up in Seattle who are both uh, writers. So yeah, I mean, there, there definitely is a lot of writers in the area. Just the community feels different because when I lived in New Mexico, it was pre-COVID. So people were getting together all the time for like parties and that kind of stuff. Nobody's doing that right now. So uh, it's a little different feel, but the the community definitely exists here. And do, does the community or you, you guys get together and talk about your work and things that you're working on and do you read each other's stuff? No. Is that kind of how it, no. no, when a bunch of writers get together, the last thing we want to talk about generally is work. our current project or the publishing world. I mean, obviously you do talk about publishing some, like if, if somebody's fighting with their publisher or they just got a great contract or whatever, you know, you'll chat about that. But, uh, but do you all know, talk about books, other books? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. If you could go back and play a role, anyone that existed in a movie, what would it be and why? I feel I should disqualify Die Hard and Aliens. Stephen Perry, <laughs> a.k.a. Loves Tech. And then I guess we can modify that question for you if you could have written any movie. You know, it's, it's my favorite question. It's the, uh, the, the, um, yesterday, the movie yesterday question. If you woke up in a parallel universe and one movie wasn't made or one movie wasn't invented and you can sit down and write, if I could sit down and write back the future and be like, check out this Ty, you know, what would that be? You know what? I would have to say, uh, well, you go first. Wow. Um, I mean, the, the, the number one of, for me is alien. I, I, I think it's one of the, the tightest movies the tightest scripts ever and and just a wonderfully wonderfully real script with amazing real dialogue with people talking the way people actually talk and it's just it, it it's a movie i can watch over and over and over again just to listen to the dialogue and and but honestly for me as a writer like if i could have written something as my first movie project that didn't already exist i would want to write reservoir dogs I mm. think Reservoir Dogs is a fucking great script. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's 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 cool to hate on Quentin Tarantino now for some reason. I don't know why, but that guy can write like a motherfucker. Who hates and, on Tarantino? I, I don't. I haven't. Got oh, that. I just I, you know, people come and go in their popularity, and it's like cool to think he's not cool anymore. I guess, but I, I, that's bullshit. That guy can write like a bastard. And Reservoir Dogs is such a fucking powerhouse first movie script uh, true romance is 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 good too but it got changed a lot by tony scott so i don't think it's it's it is true to what quentin intended it to be i think it's great though i think it's, it's great like, it's really, no yeah. tony scott's a great director so or was a great director so so i'm not saying he ruined it i'm saying it's different 
and Reservoir Dogs, I think, is the first movie that was actually putting on screen what Quentin Tarantino was and what he was trying to do with movies. And I, I love that script. I love that movie. Um, if, if that didn't exist and I could be the guy who wrote it, I'd be thrilled. Yeah. What's interesting about Tarantino is he was kind of the king of the hip hipsters, the hipster film people for, yeah. for a while. And hipsters are temperamental by nature. I mean, they get, the, they get a lot of juice off hating something. They do. But yep. the one thing that is undeniable is Tarantino's talent. Yep. And so if you're not really a part of the hipster world and, and you see what this guy is capable of and consistently, he's consistently putting out these works of art um, and, and, you know, reaching a, a, a high point with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I loved that movie. And not only did I love that movie, I loved the book. The book that he wrote, you know, after it came over, it came out and that, you know, th- there's a, there's a difference in being a great screenwriter, but also being able to write a great novel. That's, that's a, you know, a different skill set, you know? So this guy, he is a true talent. He's a great writer and I am a fan. I'm a fan of, I am a fan of his fanship as well. I'm a fan of his podcast. Uh, when he, uh, has conversations and discusses movies and he, he's a truly a movie lover. There's no ego. Like he'll, he'll come on anybody's show. He'll, He'll go on the Ringer podcast, the rewatchables. He just loves to talk about film. So I know that there was a moment where he kind of fell out, but he's, I think he's back with a vengeance now, and his talent never left. No. He never had a moment of, of putting out you know, shitty movies. Yeah, so that's, that'd be the one for me, Reservoir Dogs, for sure. So from Brett Van Dander, from a fan point of view, what is your favorite episode of The Expanse? And which podcast episode has been the most fun slash amazing? That's a very good question, Brett. And I got to be honest, what, a, what how the universe works, this podcast or this episode that we're talking about right now might be, might be my, my favorite or one, it definitely one of my favorites. Maybe if I sit back and think deeply, but I think this one might be my favorite. Definitely this season is my favorite. Now, podcast, I think, uh, and you, you get prepared, you're answering the same question, uh, Ty. Uh, I think the best podcast that we've done, because I went back and, and listened to it, and uh, one of the ones, you know, one of the few ones I listen, sometimes I'll listen to the beginning just to make sure I order and everything and sounds good, and then I, you know, don't listen to it. But I ended up listening to the Predator one with uh, me, Ty, and Brett Simmons. I thought that was really good. I thought it was structured. I thought we hit the points. I thought we were giving somebody new, and, and it was... Um, thoughtful about a movie that was talked about ad nauseum and and beloved and i thought we might have got some new thoughts or some new opinions and maybe introduced the movie to somebody that's never seen it before um so i really enjoyed that i i enjoy the deep dives of films i love the john carpenter series we're doing i'm really excited about getting into the stephen king book, book club um but those are the things i love talking about the expanse but we've been talking about the expanse for for a while, so I like you know just being a fan, being a fan of something I'm not a, a part of, and really <clears throat> examining it from that point of view. Yeah. Um, you're you're up, Ty. So uh, a TV writer's room is a collaborative process, and often the name that is on uh, a screenplay, uh, a script for uh, an episode, is not always uh, indicative of of. I, I don't. I don't want to say this in a way that's insulting. Everybody in a writers' room is rewritten, and everybody uh, at the senior level in a writers' room does some rewriting. So this is not this, this is not to bash anybody in particular, and definitely not going there. But but uh, there's a there's a episode that I had a I did a lot of work on rewriting, and most of that was because of you, Wes. Uh, it was it was the screenplay was was written for this episode. It had a lot of Amos stuff in it, and Amos is tricky to get. Amos is, is, there's only a few writers that have ever worked on The Expanse that truly can nail an Amos scene without any revision. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty small group because he's a tricky voice to get. And I often wind up doing, or used to wind up doing a lot of Amos rewriting because I'm the guy who gets your, you know, Amos's voice. So episode uh, six of season three, which is the one where uh, the the ship goes down and they rescue the kids from the lab. I wound up doing a ton of rewriting on that episode to make sure the 
physics of what were happening in the lab and, and Amos's part of that stuff and the battles that were happening there all got right. And because of that, because I rewrote a bunch of it and, and it, I think it, that episode turned out really, really well up until the later seasons for most people, episode, Episode six of season three is one of their favorite episodes of the show. And that makes me really happy because I worked on it so much. And it has the famous, probably the most YouTube clipped scene of The Expanse ever, which is your, your famous I am that guy moment, which I wrote it. I wasn't sure if it was going to work. Like, you know, you, you put it in a script and like I could picture you saying it and I could picture that you were going to do it right. But it's also a line that gets fucked up very easily. It's a moment that gets fucked up very easily. Um, if the actor plays it at all wrong, it, that it comes across cheesy, it comes across stupid. And the, the reason I love that episode so much is because you crushed that line. Like, it was, it was so easy for it to be wrong, and you got exactly the right tone, the right voice for it. It was delivered perfectly. And it made me so happy because I was really worried about it. I spent a lot of time worried, like, is this going to work? You know, because you put stuff in a script and you're like, eh, if they do it the way I'm thinking it, it'll be great. If they do it any other way, it won't be good. I remember reading the script and this happens very few, but I remember reading the script and, and, and reading that part and just pausing and just have it just having butterflies, like feeling the pitter patter of my heart and being like, wow, this really strikes it, man. This is really a chord, you know? There, you know, have you ever had moments of somebody in your life and they, uh, they have a strong personality in one way and, and 90% of the time they just rub you like it's just like, oh God, here goes so and so. Yeah. But every now and then it's the right situation and that person shows up and you're like, oh my God, I love this guy so much right now. You know what I'm yep. saying? Because of that personality type or whatever. Whereas like, but there's something about, moments like that where you spend years building up and then you have a moment of like that of like you know where this is something where this guy comes in handy you know yeah so that one i that one i really appreciate and 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 to give you credit and so you know the little behind the scenes for the three people who care about behind the scenes tv quiet joseph production quiet stuff. quiet uh ty's about to give me credit Shh, yeah. everybody patreon members <laughs> quiet down quiet down okay wes and i worked on that scene together and the the thing that the viewers won't know is that when when Amos is talking to Prax and he says you're not that guy, there's actually in the original script there's a little more dialogue there when he's when he's talking Prax down. There's a little more dialogue talking Prax down. And you and I had a conversation where you said I can do this without that. I can play this scene without that extra line. I can make it work. And I was like, hey, do it. Let's see how it works without it. And you, you were the one who had the idea to just have Amos say, you're not that guy. And then just repeat, you're not that guy. And, with, and drop the extra line where he's talking, cracks down. And it works perfectly. So that's also part of the reason why I like that. Because this episode to me is so collaborative. Because um, the original screenwriter wrote you know, this, this really good script for the, the thing. It needed a little work because of the Amos stuff. I worked on that part. I came to you, you know, we, we gave you the script. You came to me and we worked together to like hone that scene. So every part of it was really collaborative. And the final product is, it makes me very happy. So yeah, that, that one for me. Uh, this one is from Laura Hayes, uh, fan number eight, 18. Died. Are we up to 18 now? I, I, I find that hard to believe. I find it hard to believe we have 18. Oh, uh, maybe she just... Oh, wait, is she being, is that what they call sarcasm? Um, She's making the, fun of us. The Expanse features great female characters, nuanced and diverse. But what about the men? Do you see anything forward-looking in the male characters of The Expanse and to portray both books and the show of various iterations of masculinity? I love what, and I'm just giving myself credit here, I, I love what Daniel and I do in exploring the various types of of masculinity uh the various types of of male experience because just like there isn't there isn't only one kind of female power there isn't only one kind of female empowerment you don't have to be a karate black belt with a shotgun to be an empowered female you know 
Avasarala wouldn't win a fist fight with anybody, but she's still the most powerful person in any room she walks into. Uh, Elizabeth Mitchell playing Pastor Anna. Pastor Anna's not a fighter. She can't beat somebody with a gun or, or, or beat them in a fight, but she's incredibly powerful because of her empathy and, and her strength of spirit. So just like there are many types of powerful women, there are many types of powerful men, and it doesn't have to be from physical strength. It doesn't have to be from ability to commit violence. You know, I think Prax is a very powerful character, and he's not a fighter. He's, he's, he, he's, he's not a killer. Uh, he doesn't have that, but he's, he's nurturing. He's a loving father. He's, he's a brilliant scientist. He's a, he's, a te- he's a guy who likes to work with a team and build team uh, support, and that makes him powerful. I like that Holden isn't the typical macho male hero character. He doesn't, he doesn't win every argument with his guns or his fists. And that he's also a guy who sees the power in giving up power. You know, in the, the last episode of the show, the Holden's hero move is to be offered power and give it up. I like exploring all of those different types of, of power and masculinity. Um, and it's, so it's not just for the women, it's for the men too. Uh, so yes, that is, my, that is my approach to writing powerful characters is to explore all of the ways in which a person can be powerful, not just one. Uh, did portraying Amos change you at all? And if so, how? I think I've said this on the podcast before, but I had this acting teacher. Um, her name was Sandra Seacat. And, uh, and she, you know, she changed my life. She changed my career. She really opened my eyes and my mind to what, uh, what it is we actually do um, and how it can be elevated to, to art. And that is always the goal and the thing that you're striving for. But one of the things that she says is that the parts that come to you, that there is some hole, there's some unresolved thing within ourselves. And she called us, she called us wounded healers. And she said that whenever there's a role that comes to you, she believes that that role has come to you, that there's a reason why that you're getting this role. There's something within yourself that's missing, that is also the thing that the character needs to, to, to find, the thing that the character is missing. There is damage inside of you that is in line with the character. And every great role, you're, you're examining that. You're, you're, you're diving deep straight into the weak points, straight into the vulnerability, straight into the things where in life you, you would guard it with your life, you would, you would put layers and layers and layers and layers upon over, uh, over it. But to, if you want to do authentic, honest, truthful, real work, the first thing you got to go to is that most vulnerable, hurtful spot within you. You got to confront your pride. You got to confront your ego. You got to confront and look in the mirror and be as honest as you can because you want to be honest and authentic through your work. And if you do that well, and if, you, if you're successful, then somebody watching that will also be going through the same thing. And they can have a cathartic experience. They can have a moment of being seen. They can have a moment of empathy because you're being honest and you're being true. And that's why if you've ever watched something or read something and it moves you to tears and, and, and you can't understand why, it's because something honest has been shown to you and somebody has shown you empathy through their work. And, you know, case in point, I just watched Everywhere All at Once, Everywhere All the Time, All at Once. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And that movie floored me. That movie is a work of art. That is a beautiful film saying a beautiful thing. And it has all these interesting, I don't know how they edited that. If they don't win the the, the Academy Award of Editing, I don't know who will. But the message of that movie, the spirit of that movie, just at the end when it just hits home, and it's one of those movies in that viewing experience that I walk out and I feel, I feel like that I am a better person, that I am a better man for having watched that movie and having gone through that. And that is what the, the feeling that I felt from pl- getting to play Amos for seven years. I feel like it made me a better man, it made me a better person, and it made me better to others. That's a... Um, that's- that's deep shit, man. <laughs> I, I see. I was gonna do the joke answer that uh, Jen got pregnant twice while you were playing Amos, so it must have increased your sperm count and testosterone levels. <laughs> yeah, my testosterone. <laughs> um, and that is it for the questions. And thank you guys for giving those questions. And then 
you know, when I'm at Comic-Con, I want to have a system where you guys come up. I love tying that guy. Drop your question off. You can be thinking of your question right now. You come see me at Comic-Con, drop the question off, and tie and I. And I'll, and I'll think of better ways to kind of tie in the, the podcast and everything. And when, when, when we kind of, when we feel like we hit a really, a, a more solid and stable place with COVID, then Ty and I will start to, uh, we'll, he, you know, Ty will start to go with me to certain places. And we'll, you could always bring me along. You know, I could pass out the buttons. And when the we do our Ty and That Guy show, which I want to do, I want to do like a, a live Ty and That Guy show at one point. And, and I'm going to think of a creative ways. You know what, Joseph? It might be fun to talk, ask the Patreon members, like if Ty and I were going to do a Ty and That Guy show, what venue would they want us to do it? Where would they want us to do it? Would it be in a theater and would it be a specific theater? Is there a theater that everybody, w- you know, would love and want to go to like the dome in Toronto or something like that? Would it be, you know, that would be a fun thing, like a, a fun place to go do a tie in that guy live show. So Ty, you remember, I think we talked about it on the podcast, but you remember we had that long conversation about all the Thrawn books that I read and everything. Yeah. And so, and you, I remember saying, I was like, dude, I read this book on Thrawn and this character and how interesting it was. I remember saying it was written by this guy, Timothy Zahn. And I remember you saying, oh yeah, Timothy Zahn is like, you know, one of the most important uh, novel writers in the Star Wars universe. You know, like he's, yeah, he's, I, it, yeah. yeah, I think it would be argued that he probably is the most important yeah. of the Star Wars novelists. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just read those books and like every author that I come across that I read, I kind of like do a deep dive onto them and, and, you know, uh, read about them and how, how the, he got connected. And anyway, so I kind of got familiar with him. So cut to, I'm at Dragon Con, me and old the captain standing next to each other, back to back, getting it done, signing autographs, kissing babies. This man walks up to me and he shakes my hand and he's there with his wife and his son. And he says, "Hey, I want you to know I really like the show, and uh, and I appreciate what you guys do." And um, and I and I looked at him, and I thought, "This is Timothy Zahn. <laughs> Timothy <laughs> Zahn is coming up." And I go, "I just literally read your books, man. I just read your books, and and Ty and I had a conversation with you, you know. And I told him that you know Ty is a fan of yours, and and Ty and Daniel are the ones that wrote the books for the Expanse. And you know, I was so thrilled to meet him, and I was thrilled to meet his family." And we had a great conversation and he said, uh, and I said, listen, you know, we, we do this podcast where we're just, you know, just basically a love and appreciation of what we do in art and craft and story and genre. And we would love to have you on. And so he said, you know, I, uh, I don't typically, you know, do podcasts and everything, but I love your guys show and everything. I, I would definitely come on and hang out. And so, you know, I think one thing that would be cool to talk to the Patreon members and stuff like that is like, you know, how cool would it be to have. Timothy Zahn on. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be very cool to have him on. Cool. Oh, I, one more thing from Comic Con. I got this five oh first. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, I think this means. This mean I'm a, a stormtrooper now. I'm a duck yes. to the five oh first legion. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're now. Uh, so uh, the five oh first actually came out to one of our Daniel and I did a signing in Portland a few years ago. And the 501st sent an honor guard to our signing. So we had... Oh, uh, no way. We had, yeah, we had stormtroopers. We had a Chewbacca. Uh, we, had a bunch of, we had a bunch of the 501st cosplayers at our signing. It was really cool. What's really cool is, um, you know, in The Mandalorian, they brought in the 501st uh, to, to be the stormtroopers in one of the Mandalorian scenes. Like, they, they get called for events they do so many things for charity they do they're uh, yeah. they're a really great organization there's a lot of veterans within that organization and uh i am honored to be on the dark side of the force um <laughs> and then well, andrew liptak who is a uh is a uh oh that's cool yeah um so andrew liptak is a uh journalist and reviewer of sci-fi stuff and uh, he's done some interviews with daniel and i before and written some articles about the expanse and stuff he's uh heavily involved in the 501st that's like one of his his things and yeah so i that i i i've learned a lot about that organization through him and yeah they're they're good they're good guys that's hey good well, since i since i'm a, a stormtrooper now we we should have we should have them come out and we do a tab in that guy live show um yeah, definitely and, and then we you know joseph also like we should discuss what the format should be you know like um, we'll definitely do a panel, definitely do a Q and a, but like some really fun stuff that has genre at the heart of it. Um, okay. Should we jump into the, to the episode now? Let's do it. 
Okay, so we've talked about season five, episode nine before in a podcast. We've done our typical deep dive on that. So today, you know, so if you want to get that, there's you can go on YouTube and, and, and listen to that. But today we decided to focus on, I think, one of the most exciting uh, sequences that we have done in The Expanse. And that is that epic, long shootout battle scene at, uh, what is it called? Whippa, Whippy Tanaka? <laughs> Winnipesaukee. Win, win, Winnipesaukee. <laughs> sounds like, it sounds like a, a, a camp on Porky's. Camp, camp Winnipesaukee. Um, so, <laughs> um, so it, it all started with, uh, uh, Breck Eisner and I, we went to go see 1917 just came out and we went to go see the movie and we're watching the movie and we were blown away by the cinematography and the camera work and the, the long shot. And, um, and we were walking out and I remember Breck saying to me that him and you guys have been talking about, he said that, you know, they're inspired about doing this epic long shot in that way now we don't have money like they had on 1917 so we knew that it was going to be a challenge one of the things to think about is you have hundreds of extras that are all coordinating you have live ammo you have blanks obviously shooting blanks but live blanks you have you're running and covering a lot of distance and a lot of territory all of that area has to be lit it has to be lit and has to be for a specific thing. And then you have a lot of support around you. Uh, the person uh, with the camera, there's a person guiding the person in the camera, there's a per- people keeping the cords out, um, and they can't be on camera. The logistics of this whole thing are insane, but not only that, the performance of each moment has to really work. Yeah. And so you, you have all the technical side, you got all the live ammo stuff that you can't control but then you have the story you have the performance stuff and sometimes you get so focused on making it all work and you know it was very ambitious because we only had one night to do this i'm working on something right now where you know they'll take a quarter of a page that'll take that that will shoot from morning and night till morning early morning till late at night to get a quarter of a page done whereas we're shooting eight pages uh a day in a night and so we had this epic long sequence and i remember going to breck's office early in the i mean we're talking months before we shot it and meticulously going through each moment each scene uh so like even i mean even the guy that gets shot there the timing of him falling down then cutting the camera and when he cuts those bullets got to hit that wall at the right time we're falling down they're shooting and and, you know, coming up, shooting everything. And actually, we haven't gotten into the one, the one shot yet. This is cut up pretty well. And on top of everything, it was for a reason. Yeah, it was so cold out there. And so we're about to get to, you know, we have, we're tying in these locations right now. Man, I love this episode. This brings back so many memories. I haven't seen this in so long. She goes back. Well, she hears the guys coming down the stairs. We're going now! Okay, we're getting into it right now. Right here. Okay, yep. so now we're getting into it. Boom. The guy with the camera is walking backwards. We're walking up snowy stairs with ice. The camera turns... Over here, these guys right here have to get shot. As soon as the camera hits them, they fall down. Yeah. Camera goes down to catch them fall down, come up as we're running through here. As we're running through here, they got to coordinate all the shots that are hitting as we're running against the wall. We're running against the wall. Yeah, and so now, that's the special effects team setting off their pots for each of those little bullet hits. Now we got to pan up those, you know, 20 or 30 extras up there are coming. They cue them to go down the hill as they're shooting, come down the hill. We make it towards the wall, but then we got to stop and take a stand. The camera operator, which is, we have the best camera operator in, and we have the best DP and camera operator in Canada, and that's Jay and Jeremy. Yeah. And Who, by uh, the way, have been interviewed on this show. So if you want to, if you want to see more about Jay and Jeremy, go find that episode. So, so far, everything's hitting, squibs hitting, fire. We go into side, we go inside this, um, 
this they, they turned it into what is this facility like in the fictional world uh so th- this is just a underground tunnel to get to the hangar bay for the shuttle right yeah. and then you know shut the door squibs happening turn around yeah and we uh we hit a cut in that yeah. wipe because yeah. uh these are actually two different locations I was debating and I was like, should I tell him about the hidden cut and just add oh, like yeah. this as I <laughs> No, 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 no. Everybody yeah. knows that you're hiding cuts yeah. in the wipes. Yeah, so we hit a cut there on a the wipe and we cut. So actually, Joseph, if you can back up, we'll show him where the cut was. Eric, go. So right there. Boom. So when that camera pans down, that's a wipe. There's a cut. So this is a new thing. Now, this is also a long sequence that we do within here. Yep. Handing the gun off scooping this up and then the camera is the aftermath is telling the story these guys ambushed clarissa clicked her mods she yep. murdered all those people she's she laying murdered there in everybody blood. <laughs> yeah she slaughtered those people and then and then puked and then puked and this god damn this was good i, f- I forgot this you know coming back and of course amos is the rear guard because amos is always going to be the rear guard what was that actress's name? I, she was fantastic. I'm drawing a blank. Right um, now. shit. Uh, you put me on the spot, so I'm not re- uh, not remembering. Um, she was great. Go. A lot of fun to work with. Did a, a great job with this part. I loved working with her. She was so cool, you know. And yeah. So, so talented, and then you know, fierce. You know, she gets shot in the back right here. Yep. Connection. Come back. Firing. God, this was so much fun. Dropping the shotgun. I, and I love this, where you're yeah. dragging her out, and she's still firing as she's getting pulled. Yeah. Yeah, talk about fierce. That is that is fierce right there. You got a bullet in your back, and you're still unloading your gun. Right. Hit the thing. We lay on the floor because we know the G-forces are and coming. Then, and then, of course, now cut, because yeah. now we've moved up to a different scene. Yeah. Yeah, now cut. So I, one of the things I want to talk about um, with this with this. Uh, single unbroken sequence kind of stuff the the one cut stuff i don't want to be negative but there is there's always a price to be paid for this stuff so so one of the things uh so directors love the long unbroken shot stuff they love that because it is it is a a director's sequence because all the stuff you talked about the lighting the the camera moves all of that stuff that's that's the director's world so Getting all that stuff right is really their world. And so they love coordinating a sequence like that. And it really, because the storytelling is all in the camera, and the camera is the director's instrument on set. So they love those kinds of long, unbroken sequences. But writers don't necessarily love them. And the reason writers don't love them is because the thing that you always lose with those sequences is the details. So there's a ton of details in the script for that sequence that just never show up because the, the camera's moving so fast and everything is so frantic. So you get a lot of the, the trade-off, and I learned this making this show, which is a really good thing to know, is those long unbroken sequences, you get energy and you sacrifice detail. And so the, the, whenever you're having the conversation, the director is always going to be, hey, we should do this as a long unbroken sequence. The question you're always asking yourself as a writer and producer is, is this more of an energy scene or are the details important in this scene? And if the details are important, you can't do it that way. If it's a more of an energy scene, then it's okay to sacrifice those details to get the energy. And in this sequence, it was agreed. And you know, the showrunner, Nurin Shankar, he makes the final decision. That's his, that's his veto power. He agreed that the it was worth the sacrifice of some of the details in the screenplay in order to get that energy. So for the three people who care about how TV shows are made, that is the conversation that happens in the producing room to come to that decision. But you know, I think perform, uh, perf- it benefits performance as well because the the momentum of the scene. That, you know, so, you know, when a scene is going well is when you are not aware that it's going well, when you're just reacting, that you're just present in the circumstances and you're fighting for what you want in the scene and you're reacting. And sometimes when things are chopped up and cut up, it's really hard to get the whole picture. It's really hard to maintain and be 
um, in the continuity of your energy levels and maintain those energy levels within these kind of choppy versions and also to not get in your head and to not watch yourself. But when you don't have a, t- when you don't have a choice and you got to react and you're pushing forward and moving forward, some of the best work and some of the, you know, um, that you get from that, you know, does happen in this. Now, again, you do sacrifice details because there might be a bit nuanced choices you would have liked to make, but you don't make them in the moment. Yes, you can get the big performance very well in these long and broken takes. You cannot get any subtlety into performance. Yeah. Um, the camera is never going to linger on your face long enough for you to deliver you know, subtle facial expressions to it. They got uh, it in 1917, though. They got that subtlety, they, you know. They, they got it there. did because the camera, so it's that show, that movie is played out as if it is one long unbroken take. Obviously, it's not, but it's played out as if it is. But the camera has moments where it is very still. Mm-hmm. And that's what allows them to do that. So the sequence that we did in Pasaki, the camera is never motionless. The camera is never still. It is moving all the time. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so in 1917, you could get some of that subtlety because the camera will stay still for a while. It'll just yeah. sit there. It'll allow the scene to develop in front of it without moving. So, th- so th- again, these are always trade offs that whenever you, whenever you make a choice in directing or producing or writing or performing, like, you know, in, in your acting, that choice precludes other choices. It always does. And so the, the question always is, is this the right choice for this moment? This sequence was all about big movements and energy. So it was the right choice for this sequence for sure. But there, but there's some subtle things that are happening in this scene that always bugs me that the camera doesn't catch. But yeah, you know, most people are never going to notice. Like 90% of the audience isn't going to notice. It's the closest thing to uh, theater that you're going to get on film. You know, yeah. that unbroken, that unbroken take. Yeah. Um, it's funny because it was cold. But I it almost broke old Jacob Mundell. I remember <laughs> it was like our hundred and fiftieth take of that long thing, and it was freezing, <laughs> and people were exhausted, and you know, beat up. And I and I went over there, and he was kind of he was in the uh, in, uh, in the little garage area, and he was kind of standing there, and he was like standing by a heater, and he was just shivering, and he was looking down. And I go, "Hey man, are you okay?" And he turned around and goes, "I'm barely." fucking hanging on right now man (laughs) (laughs) hey guys uh just so you know i did ask him to see if he could come on today and we might want to give him a congratulations uh he couldn't because he's flying out and getting married this weekend oh no shit oh no shit awesome yeah congratulations jacob congratulations Uh, jacob on your nuptials uh ty and i are sending our best wishes and our love uh congratulations buddy um, I, I, but, I, I met, uh, I met Jacob's partner at the, uh, rap party. Yeah. Uh, lovely, lovely person. So, yeah. uh, nothing but congratulations to Jacob and his partner. And, but he said that and I cried laughing. It was the, it was so <laughs> funny. Jacob's funny. He's got good delivery of things. He um, is funny. He is funny. Yeah. And he's not, he's not a, he's not a, a burly guy. Um, he's, he's, he's thin and the outfits that you guys had on for those sequences are not super big. No. So I can imagine the cold was just cutting through him like a knife. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's, uh, let's get to our top five. Well, hold on, hold on. I want to, I want to complain about the sequence that Sorry. doesn't get captured so that I can explain to people what's going on. Cause I have been asked this many times. So there is a there is a sequence where uh, Amos goes over to the wall to fire covering fire, and then his head snaps back as if he if he's been hurt. Mm. People are like, "Did he get shot there? What happened?" So what's written in the script is that a bullet hits the wall next to his head, and a spray of rocks and gravel and stuff from that bullet hit on the wall spray into his eye and and around his eye. Um, and that's why he's staggered, and that's why his eyes kind of messed up, and uh, that's the injury that happens there. But the camera couldn't catch that, so the, that that does happen. There's a squib that goes off; it does blow some particles, and and there's some uh, visual effects there to make it seem like some stuff hit him in the eye. But it happens so quickly, you don't see it. You don't see it happen. So people always are like, "Did he get shot? What happened to him?" 
Um, so for you in the audience, the eight people who watched the, that episode and wondered what happened to Amos, that is what's happening there. The unbroken take thing didn't allow us to get a close enough shot to actually see it happening. So it kind of gets lost in the mix a little bit. Oh, so, you know, I was unaware of that. I mean, I, I think it's because I, because I was the one that got this stuff in the eye. So when I see it quickly, I get it. I register yeah. it and I know what it is, but I didn't think about somebody that didn't know what was going on and, and right. seeing yeah. that. So, yeah. All right. Our top five today is last stands. <sighs> this was a pretty, uh, Winnipesaukee is a pretty good last stand. Well, I guess we'll read them off because I already know what yep. my number one is. Uh, yep. Die Hard, Zero Position, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, fantastic movie, Seven Samurai, Assault on Preseek 13, The 13th Warrior, 300, Predator, Serenity, Black Hawk Down, Save It, Private Ryan, Gallipoli, Lone Survivor, The Alamo, We Were Soldiers, Inglorious Bastards, The Matrix Revolution, Scarface, Rogue One, Benghazi, Fury, Young Guns, Glory, Zulu, yeah, wow. I mean, there's so many good ones. I, I will say that uh, uh, Gallipoli is brutal. That is a brutal last stand. That is brutal. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to watch. Yeah. It is old, hard to watch. It's so Old, old Melvin Gibbs, Gibson's in that. Yeah, baby. Baby Mel. Baby Mel. Yeah. God, he was handsome. Um, He was a good-looking man. He was a good-looking man. Uh, I'm, I'm, dude... I don't. I mean, you, we can argue about it, but my number one is the Thirteenth Warrior. I, I don't. I love that movie. And that last stand. I mean, you know that movie. You know, you have these Vikings, thirteen of them, and they're facing this mystical underground race of people that have this witch-like power, and they're terrifying. The whole world of these things are terrifying. And it was based off the Michael Crichton book, uh, Eaters of the Dead. And in that book, you know, basically his um, theory of what this is. And, and by the way, these, these are, there are true, um, there are, there's retelling of this time where there was a mysterious race of people that would come and, and terrorize people like this. And what the theory is of the book is that this is a, lesser evolved Neanderthal human or, or, or something like that, that there, cause there was a time when, uh, homo sapiens and these other Neanderthals, whatever existed within the same space and humans outperformed the homo sapiens outperformed them. And so, you know, there's something really mystical and interesting about, uh, a, another race of humans existing along, you know, with, with these humans and they're so ancient and there's so few but uh, they would come and terrorize this village and these group of people. And the 13th warrior, uh, warriors, they knew that they were going to die. They knew that they were outmatched. And, and when the fog came rolling down in this mysterious entity, they call it the snake because it was so many of them and they were dark and they came in with the, thaw, the fog and they challenged well, they had the They had the burning torches, so it was the fire, the fire serpent coming down the mountain. You're right, the fire serpent. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. it in a while, so I'm probably making a lot of mistakes. No, that's okay. And, and uh, so they come down and they make an assault, and it's just so bad ass. Um, do we have Lord of the Rings on this list? There's a lot of last stands in that. There's a bunch of there's there's uh, the uh, the Battle at Helm's Deep, which is yeah. a huge last stand. Yeah. Um, and then there's the the Battle at uh, Minas Tirith, um, which is basically like an entire movie long last stand. Which one was your favorite? Helm's Deep is be is 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 definitely the better as as a last stand goes. Yeah, okay. let's throw uh, Lord of the Rings, Helm's Deep up there. Yeah. Oh, I dude, I was a fan of the Last Samurai. I think that's a great, that's a fantastic last stand. In the last, uh, if we're gonna do a samurai movie, though, I'm I'm me, I'd go Seven Samurai. Yeah, I think Seven Samurai is still the best samurai last stand movie ever made. Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid for me. It's hard. It's hard to go wrong with that movie. That yeah, I, I I would argue that that is maybe one of the best American movies ever made. Yeah, I would argue that with you. I would be on your side. I love that film. Movie. All of these are good uh, last stands. I mean, I, you and I both love Assault on Precinct Thirteen. Yeah, uh, we've we just recently talked about Predator. That last stand between Arnold and the Predator is fantastic. I'm a big Firefly fan, so the movie Serenity is great for me. The, the last stand with the Reavers is awesome. 
Black Hawk Down is basically an hour and a half long last stand. Lone Survivor, I just rec- I, I had seen Lone Survivor when it first came out, and I recently rewatched it because it came available, I think, on HBO Max or whatever. Uh, it didn't hold up from as, as well for me on the on the second watch, uh, but it's a good movie. I mean, it's well made. It just didn't hold up as well. Um, I, I, I'm going to go I, with your your initial instinct uh, with which Gallipoli. Is, yeah, I, I, I well, I was getting down to there. Gallipoli is one of the most punishing movies I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, uh, but it is it is absolutely an intense fucking movie, man. It's so emotional. It's so it's so um, emotional. But yeah. uh, it really, I mean, you know, it really hammers home the last stand theme that we're talking about. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, and it's got that combination of things that, for me, makes the last stand even more powerful. So defending, of the, ashes, defending the ashes of your fathers and the temples of your gods, you know, that old, that old saying from, I think this from like Roman days. That is the classic last stand where it's like, there's something behind me that I treasure that I don't want to be heart. There's the, the invading hordes in front of me. I'm the thing that stands between those two things. And I've got to, I've got to make my last stand here to protect the things I care about. You know, the ashes of my father and the temples of my gods, right? The thing that is punishing for me in the last stand is when the lives are thrown away for no reason. and. Gallipoli is so wasteful. It's it is it is the British Empire throwing away the lives of a bunch of New Zealanders and Australians because they just don't give a shit about them. And it's it's unnecessary. It was an unnecessary battle. Everybody knew it was a bad idea. Um they they the commanders had been warned that this is not a good idea to do this. They did it anyway because they just didn't give a shit about those people. And so the the reason that you fight then becomes not the temples of your gods, it becomes the guy in the foxhole nest to you who's your brother in arms, who you have come to love because of that. That becomes the reason you're fighting. And that there is nothing more emotional than that. Uh we you know we 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 talk about that in the expanse when when Amos and and Bobby are having their conversation in the bar in season six, and he says, "I don't know what I'm doing here." And she she lists off all the reasons that she's been a soldier before, and all the reasons she's fought before, and she ends with, "The only reason you fight is for the guy covering your flank. That's why you fight." And Gallipoli is the ultimate movie of that. Those those guys are fighting to protect the guy covering their flank because all of the normal reasons you fight a war have been taken away from them and 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 their what li- their lives are being thrown away for no reason so all they have left is each other and if that doesn't punch you in the stomach watching it uh, I, I i question if you're human or not okay let's see what they had die hard zero seven samurai the 13th warrior they know us die they know us man they, they got they got us. two out of five this time they know they knew the they 13th warrior was going to be on our list that yeah. blows my mind because the 13th warrior is not a well-known movie. It's uh, not. All right, we'll end on that. That's the that was the, the 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 purpose and the meaning of the podcast. True justice in the American way. Um <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for hanging out. Please like and subscribe and do do all the things and thank you for your support. Thank you for coming out to Dragon Con. I hope to ask him more questions. We hope to do events some at some time. And uh yeah, you guys are the best. Thank you so much. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.